Mornings were out, said Pat Barker, when asked when she would like to be interviewed. That was her writing time. Afternoons, however, were fine, and of late she has been spending them learning to drive. We agreed to meet at her home in Durham, the university and cathedral city in the northeast of England. The novelist lives on what the taxi driver boasted was the biggest estate in Europe, in a semi-detached house with her husband, who is an academic. They have two children, both now in their twenties, and three exotic cats. Pat Barker was born in 1943 and went to the London School of Economics before becoming a history teacher and marrying at 26. Her first novel, Union Street, a series of linked stories set on a working-class street, was published in 1983 when she was 39. Up until then, she concentrated on bringing up her children, a job she took very seriously. She wears glasses, has her hair cut short and seems slightly diffident, as if she is still getting used to having the spotlight shine on her. There is a northern bluntness about her demeanour. My family taught me about being a fighter, she once said. From an early age, I was familiar with combat on several levels. Her father ran off before she was born, and she was brought up by her maternal grandparents. In The Man Who Wasn't There, her fourth novel published in 1989, she explores her unusual background. Even when her mother later married, Barker remained with her grandparents. Her grandmother ran a fish and chip shop. Her grandfather was a slaughterman who had fought in World War I. From him, she says, came most of the grit for her trilogy of war novels, Regeneration, The Eye in the Door and The Ghost Road, which won the Booker Prize for Fiction in 1995. Can I ask you, take you right back and ask you a very fundamental question. Why do you write? What what made you start to write? God knows. I mean, I I think I write because I can't so far think of a way of stopping. If I could, I would. (laughs) Would you really? (laughs) Yes, I think so, yes. Do you not feel uh, it's a bit of a drug that you enjoy doing it when you're doing it? No, I don't enjoy doing it. I, I, I enjoy writing quite rarely. I enjoy it when it's going well, and it goes well quite rarely. So you're not in agony when you're writing, are you? I'm in agony when it's going wrong, yes. Yes. Mm. And it, it is still always going wrong, you see. Um, I, I think it, 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 people write differently, but for me, you, you write two or three or four bad books in order to, with any luck at all, get one good book out at the end of it. Uh, and they end up in the waste paper basket. The bad books end up in the waste yes. paper basket. I hope so, yes. <laughs> yes. Well, some, <laughs> we, 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 some of them don't. <laughs> no, some of them don't, that's right. Um, yeah. You're not in trouble unless you don't know you're in trouble. I think that's the, the watchword. And I wonder about this feeling of, uh, you know, not enjoying it. Is it a f- feeling of panic? Is it a feeling of sickness? Is it, is it a feeling of anxiety? I mean... All how, those, all those, yes. <laughs> and, and, and how do you live with yourself and how do other people live with you when you're going through that? Um, I've got an extremely supportive agent, poor man. Uh, my God, he earns his money. Um... And my husband is endlessly patient. And, of course, it doesn't always go badly. I mean, there's nothing like it, I have to say, when it's going well. When you feel that you've brought off something difficult, intrinsically difficult to do, that is a tremendous moment. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm coming to the end. I have come to the end of a particularly bad patch. So if I sound a little bit jaundiced about the whole business, that's the reason. Because... uh... I remember uh, reading uh, Raymond Carver and he was asked, why did he write short stories? He said, because a novel is too much emotional uh, investment. Um, I'm, I have to worry about something that I'm going to be sticking with for two or three years anyway. Mm. And then what happens if it doesn't work? What happens if there's no financial reward for it? A short story at least is here and gone and out there and I'm paid for it. I mean, your trilogy took, I think, eight years Yes, something like that. Um, yes, I under- I, uh, Barry Hines once said to me that, or said in my presence rather, that uh, writing a novel was like a very long illness and he was tired of being ill. And <laughs> it is a bit like that. Um, I suppose I now have the security of knowing that there will be, you know, there will be an audience, there will be a publisher uh, when it's finished, um, which, of course, was not true with Union Street, which was written blind. Um, it was sort of beaming signals to Mars and not getting any back. 
Um, I think all you can say is that you, there's no point having the talent uh, if you don't have the temperament. And I think a lot of um, people who find writing intrinsically difficult are people who have the talent and don't have the temperament to endure this uh, crazy marathon run that we put ourselves through. When you think back and, and think to your situation now, would you rather be someone setting out again as a, as a writer who the world hadn't heard of? Or do you feel it's easier now to, to, as it were, write from a position of strength, knowing that you've got readers waiting for your next book? Is it, does that not create its own anxieties, that they have an expectation of what they want from you? Yes, I think, I think post-booker is, a, um, is probably a time of great anxiety. Um, would I rather be starting out again? I would rather be spared having the compulsion to write at all, I think. Really? Yes, I would make a very good publisher. I think that's the fun side. <laughs> When did you realise you were going to be a writer, that you wanted to be a writer? I was about 10 or 11 years old when mm -hmm. I started writing. Um, yes, I, I knew then, and I actually knew it was going to be novels. Uh, I didn't think of short stories or plays or films or anything like that. I knew it was going to be novels. Did you try and write a novel then? Yes, I did. I wrote a sort of, uh, sort of bodice ripper set in Ruritania which was, uh, I'm sure, great fun. <laughs> and does it exist at all? Is it going yeah, to appear in the juvenilia? I, no, no, I'm afraid I tore it up because you know, I wrote it when I was 11 and I think when I was sort of 12 and a half I thought it was unsophisticated and juvenile and I didn't, unfortunately, have see it as a gem, which it probably was, you know, a comic genius gem, of course. <laughs> but were you a bookish child? Did you, did you read a lot as a child? Um, with the family yes I, I read a lot I read a lot and I read very quickly mainly from the public libraries the only books that we had in the house were the um, uh, a, a very antiquated um, series of encyclopedias which my uh, grandfather had bought and these were dated back to before the first world war and they were fast they were actually uh, for somebody growing up in the 50s they were a fascinating read because I mean they they, uh, you, I was able to read, for example, quite definitively and authoritatively that uh, space travel was completely impossible. And, of course, I was actually living through it. So you gave, it gave you totally out-of-date information, but on the other hand, for that very reason, a very sceptical attitude to, to the received opinion. So you could see that all of it was wrong. It's wonderful, though, to read old encyclopedias and read outdated information and to think that other people had taken it as gospel truth and it would always be like that, immutable, yes, it's in yes, stone. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, and, and the social attitudes, of course, as well. When you write a book, um, irrespective of whether it's Union Street or the, the trilogy, uh, do you know where you're going from day one? I mean, the day one that you start to write. Um, have you, how, for example, how much planning do you do? Um, well, it all gets up, mixed up... With Union Street, I just knew, you know, seven ages of women, um, and I knew that I wanted them, in a sense, to be one facets of one woman. Uh, so that was the basic idea, and I just ploughed forward. Um, nowadays, of course, it's become very complicated, because if you're being commissioned in advance, you have to supply a synopsis as a selling tool for your agent. So I do produce now quite detailed synopses, uh, which are... A snare and a delusion, really, because they they freeze your they freeze your thoughts at a particular stage of the creative process. They encourage the publisher to believe that he or she is getting something that resembles that, which may or may not be true, but probably not. And uh, they are, uh, you know, synopses are artistically bad news. It's much better if you 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 approach the whole thing in a more fluid way and uh, don't nail your colours to the mast like that. But it's inevitable. Nobody's going to give you a large sum of money on the basis of a badly written, vague paragraph. They just won't do it. But this seems a very modern phenomenon. You know, I can't recall the Hemingways or whatever of the world uh, saying, here's, here's a few paragraphs and this is what it'll be like, um, Max Perkins, and um, in a couple of years' time you'll be able to get it. Meanwhile, go out there and sell the best of it to W.H. Smith and tell them it's coming. I think it is a modern phenomenon, and I think it's... Uh, is to do with um, corporate publishing, large advances, things, you know, powerful agents. Uh, it's the uh, creative climate we move in. Though some writers still don't. Some writers simply write the book 
uh, when they're satisfied, give it to the agent who then sells it to the highest bidder, which is a much safer thing for the publisher, I would think. What, what do you expect from a publisher? What, what ideally do you want a publisher to do for you? Um, to be a completely translucent interface between me and the reader. Uh, and that would mean that you needed uh, enormous confidence in their judgment. You, you want um, a tuning fork that when you hit it, uh, you know, gives you the note. Uh, so that that is the sort of editorial function. And obviously you, you also need good distribution, energetic publicity and marketing and all that. How do you work then? Could you just describe your routine? Um, for example, um, over what kind of stretch would you work? Would you work um, early in the morning to lunchtime? Uh, do you work at six months at a stretch? Um, um, is there parts no, of the I, year I, where you would never work? Yeah, uh, I'm working all the time, basically. Um, mornings, uh, it's, it's, it's a matter of um, doing, say, 10 or 12 pages. Um, rarely I manage to do more than 10 or 12 pages, but actually, uh, I find that if I've written 15 pages, even if I've written them in the morning, I couldn't possibly go back in the afternoon because I'm absolutely exhausted by that. I don't know why. I don't know why it's physically tiring, but it is physically tiring as well as mentally tiring. And what can you do in the afternoon then after you've done that? Write letters. <laughs> Write letters, you know, just flop out, go for a walk, go for a swim, do something physical, ideally, if I've got the energy left for doing something physical. Um... If it's really bad, sort of just lie on the bed and think, <laughs> try to get myself into a fit state for the evening. <laughs> Do you read other people while you're writing? I mean, for example, to go back to the trilogy, would you uh, read um, First World War novels at the time when you were doing that? Or is it too um, too much of a risk to take? Your, your, your style might become infected with someone else's style. I think it's too much of a risk to take. Um, that infection, I, I don't think it happens to me now, but it certainly did happen at one stage, at an early stage. And um, you, know, you, you don't want other people's fiction in your mind. I, I, read, I read history, I read biography, and I read a lot of poetry while I'm writing. But I tend to avoid reading fiction if I possibly can. Mm. And but then I read fiction, quite a lot of fiction, in quick bursts in between books. And for the research of a, a book like the, the, the War Trilogy... I mean, obviously, unless you've inherited an awful lot of knowledge about it, and I believe you have from a grandfather, mm. um, research is is needed there, surely. Oh, yes, uh, but then the research is quite nice because you get out of the house and you go and meet librarians who are very nice people. And uh, it's marvellous, actually. I mean, it's, I found I felt a quite distinct pleasure in doing research, which was different from the dubious pleasures of writing. <laughs> Do you ever feel overwhelmed when you walk into a library and think, you know, why am I adding another book to the piles that are here already? Um, no, I feel that in bookshops. I don't feel it in libraries, actually. I, I think libraries are much friendlier places than bookshops. I walk into bookshops sometimes, even when they're well laid out, and I think, why are any of us doing it, you know? Because uh, increasingly these books are jacketed and marketed in a way which shrieks for attention, and only a tiny minority of them are ever going to get any. Uh, that is uh, daunting at times. Can, can you talk about where you actually work and the surroundings in which you work and the conditions that you need? You've talked about the need for to have some affection between you and the implements of the trade, but what about the room in which you work and... Um, I like the room in which I work. It's, it's quite large. It's got a window at both ends, one window looking out into a street, the other window overlooking the garden. Uh, it's a rather narrow room. It has a fire. It has a Tom McGuinness picture of three miners going down the shaft so that when I sort of start feeling sorry for myself, I think, look, come on, this is pure self-indulgence being allowed to do that. Um, and it's got flowers and you know things like that. Um, and at the moment it isn't too messy, so I'm happy with it. At the end of the trilogy, it was a complete nightmare because I couldn't put anything away. Everything had to be open because I didn't know what I was going to need. So it was like sort of the proverbial old lady's junk shop, you know, newspapers and God knows what on the floor. You wouldn't be surrounded by books when you were writing? Um, there are books in the room, but I'm, I'm not sort of looking at a bookcase. I, wouldn't, I don't think I would want to do that. Could you work with anyone in the room? 
No, not even my husband, I think. Uh, I would always want to be alone in the room. And I, I, for that reason, can't write in libraries. I can do notes in libraries, but I can't actually do creative work in libraries. And you sit down to write? Sit down in a specially designed, anatomically correct chair, having bust my back up on numerous occasions by... Because it, it's, it, there's something about a computer which is particularly compelling. And if, it, it, if you're going well, the computer screen is almost mesmerising. And if you're sitting in a bad position, you don't notice it. Uh, I think this is where you get things like repetitive strain injury and bad backs and all the rest of it. And can you work with music in the background? I don't like to work with music in the background because I'm very often either saying dialogue aloud or listening to the dialogue in my head, and really you need total silence to be able to do that. I was going to ask you about uh, writer's block and um, if such a thing exists. Um, Gore Vidal said, if you've got writer's block, you're not a writer. I don't think I've ever had writer's block. Um, I think what I have had is terrible problems with particular, terrible structural problems with particular books. But I think that I think that is almost routine, actually. Um, uh, no, I, I think if I think if I had writer's block and I simply couldn't write anything, I would be inclined to say, well, yes, that's it. You know, well, go off and have a long holiday. If that doesn't work, think of something else to do, and why not? Do you, do you think in terms of your, your strengths and weaknesses as a writer? I mean, um, are you a good plotter? Um, are, are, is style your forte? Um, are you good at uh, developing characterisation? Um, I mean, what, what, what comes naturally to you and, and what, what doesn't? Uh, I think I'm quite good at characterisation. I, d- I wouldn't describe myself as a stylist. I hope there are not, n- there are, that there aren't any gaffes or clichés or anything which would trip the reader up by being bad style, but I, I don't think I have a style which in any way draws attention to itself, and it would not never be my ambition to develop such a style. Um, I think characterisation probably... And I think that's what I value most in novels, because I think I think char- the character is what remains with you uh, after you've forgotten the plot, you know, and, and the style has ceased to startle. You can have these characters as part of the furniture of your mind for decades of your life. And these characters do things that you don't want them to do from time to time. They do things that surprise me, but initially. But I, I think I think that's the thing. You know, somebody once said that the the ending of a novel should be. Uh, both inevitable and completely unexpected. I think what the character does should, at a crisis in his life, should be both inevitable and completely unexpected. Um, as so often, when real people startle you, uh, they don't startle you by doing something which makes no sense. They startle you by doing something which makes perfect sense, but you didn't have the depth of knowledge to see that it was perfect sense. Do you choose your own titles for your books? Oh yes, always. Yes. And do they come easily to you? Um, I say, I just, I, I'll go back on that. The the one title that uh, my third novel was called Liza's England when I, when I was working on it, it became the Century's Daughter because the publisher's sales force didn't like Liza's England, and uh, when it was went into Penguin uh, into Virago Classics, I sort of asked for them to take my t- working title back again. Uh, the Century's Daughter suggests a certain kind of book and Liza's England is a quite different kind of book and it represents it better. Um, the title, some, the re- title of Regeneration came comparatively late in the book, the title of this one quite early. Um, somebody once pointed out to me that um, titles which work well have O's in them. It's it's because of a subliminal effect. It looks like two eyes and it catches people's eyes in the bookshop. Really? Yeah. Now, you can't get more mindless than that. But on the other hand, it's, it sets it's, you... It's, it makes you think. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver, yes. <laughs> Oliver Twost. <laughs> I'm sure there are exceptions to that rule. Catch-22. Yes, that's right, yes. Could we just talk just for a little bit about the, the trilogy then and um, where... The, the wellspring for that came from what, what, what's, the, what's the origin of the trilogy um, was this the book you were always limbering up to write well it wasn't a trilogy to begin with um, no I was limbering up to write about the first world war but I, I didn't know how to do it for, for a hell of a long time 
One of the first things I wrote was a poem about the First World War. When I was 11, just starting out to write. Uh, but, I, you know, it, it, when I was writing sort of um, books about working class life, working class women's lives, there was a sort of absence of uh, in the models and materials on the bookshelves. And when you get to the First World War, of course, there are whole libraries devoted to the First World War, so suddenly you're sort of inundated with material, and it's very difficult to find any sort of even slightly new way into the subject. And so it was really only when I uh, happened upon the character of Rivers, a histor real historical character of Rivers, that I felt I was onto something. And it became um, a book which is almost as much about... Uh, the history of medicine, it draws on that at least as heavily as it draws on the history of the battlefields. Because the story of um, Sassoon and Owen at Craig Locker is very well known, isn't it? Yes, which is why Owen in the trilogy is uh, deliberately forced into the background as much as possible. I felt he was too well known. He was, he was well known to the point where people knew what they thought about him before they started reading about him. Whereas Rivers, I think, is sufficiently unknown for that not to be a problem. It's very hard to turn Owen into fiction just because of that very powerful legend around him. In terms of Rivers, then, did, did you, in a sense, create his biography before you could start to write the fiction? Well, there is a biography of Rivers by uh, Richard Slobodin, who is an anthropologist, and I wrote about Rivers primarily as an anthropologist. It didn't discover much about his personal life, perhaps, but because Rivers took good care that people didn't, I think. He was a very uh, private man. Um, I, 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 would, I corresponded with Slobodin, and I think we've agreed that his Rivers and my Rivers are basically identifiably the same person. We don't feel that there's any great gap. Uh, at the same time, of course, you, if you put a real character into fiction, you have to make them, in a sense, an imagined character. It's not as different from the... The real uh, from the fictional characters, as people think, use this that you still have to imagine them in the world, in their world. Um, the main difference, I think, between writing about real characters and writing about fictional characters, for me at any rate, is that you have an obligation to be fair to the historical characters, and you have no obligation at all to be fair to the, to the people you create. But, so you're already putting a constriction on yourself when you set out to write. Now here, um, here's the paradox. Um, a fiction writer uh, using real characters in a novel uh, already putting limitations on herself and what, what she can do. Yes, but I think they're very, I think they're very creative limitations. Um, I, didn't want to, I didn't want to falsify any facts if, if the facts were known. Um, it, it's easy to represent that as if it's... Um, a sort of a kind of imprisonment, but I, I think on the contrary that the taking a, a character from real life, as all novelists do, I think to some extent, giving them a fictional identity and feeling free to say anything you like about them um, sounds like perfect freedom, but it isn't perfect freedom, it's perfect self indulgence, and that is a very different thing. Uh, I, I found the constrictions of historical fact liberating. In terms of the writing and, and, and the research, did you visit the locations? Did you go to Craig Lockhart? Did you go to the yes, battlefields? Yes, I, I went to Craig Lockhart many times. I also, uh, for the third book, but not for the first two books, went to the battlefields and traced uh, Wilfred Owen's progress to the front, mm -hmm. and which is also, of course, the progress made by my fictional character, Billy Pryor. And has anyone said, look, you, 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 you've committed a terrible solecism here, you know, I know what this was exactly like, and... No, uh, the only things that have been pointed out to me is uh, salted salted peanuts in regeneration, and the collared dove um, in also in regeneration. The first collared dove hooted in England or tweeted or whatever it is the hell they do in 1947, <laughs> and I had one in 19, 1917. Let me just uh, um, close by asking you about influences and the books that you've read, um, because if you've been from the age of ten, uh, thereabouts, wanting to become a writer, um, there must have been writers along the way saying, well, if only I could be like that writer, or I'd love to write a book like that. Um, are there those people cropping up or, or not? Are you somebody who says, oh, I just want to write like myself and write my own kind of books and... Yes. To hell with the rest. 
Well, I was once asked by a publisher whose books would I have wanted to writ- to write if I hadn't written my own books. And I do actually think it's a meaningless question. Um, I mean, there are people you admire, but you can admire people who are totally different from you, who are so far different from you in talents that you know you couldn't emulate a single sentence and you're just grateful that they wrote their books. But if you say, wow, to, when, you know, when you're reading someone, is there anyone like that? Or say, well, there's no point in me attempting that. I think that's absolutely marvellous. I, I say wow when I'm reading poets, I think. Um, I think I've got to the stage where, with fiction now where... Um, it's very difficult to read innocently anymore. Uh, you're, you're sort of looking at you're looking for the joins, um, I, and I, I know people who write for radio, for television, who they're so busy with the camera angles that they are not sort of sitting there enjoying themselves anymore. And uh, I, yes, I read poets for pleasure now rather than novelists. Thank you very much, Pat Barker.